Hello there guys, Taff Away here, and I'm bringing you another video. The reviews are back, baby. But before we get to that, I would like to apologize for the audio as of late. Uh, I recently purchased a new microphone, and I just realized that I've been mixing the audio improperly with the new setup that we have. So hopefully this is better and easy for you guys to understand. Let me know in the comment section down below if you enjoy the changes. And now let's get to it. I was drawing this for months, but Bendis came, and like any large, bald guy who comes when you don't want him to, he isn't sorry about anything. This is going to be another mega review. Brian Michael Bendis often writes for the trade. So here I'm going to review all six issues of Man of Steel. I won't be taking too many jabs at Bendis' comments towards the reader, and ignore all the promises that he's made. The only thing I'll be addressing is this claim that we're going to be apologizing for our fear of what he's going to do to our book. Fuck you. Oh, fuck you, fuck you. Fuck you, fuck you. Fuck you, fuck you. That said, refresher on our reviewing method. First, I'll briefly summarize the plot of the book, talk about the good, the bad, and the effects on continuity. Also, I'll rate the individual issues out of 10, add them all up, and then divide by 6 for the overall ranking, followed by if I recommend this book or not. So in the first issue, Superman puts out a fire. We introduce a female firefighter who is now a supporting character. We get flashbacks to a character called Rogozar, a warrior who is a well-known to the cosmic entities who wants to have Krypton destroyed and is told no. And this white light shows up before Clark, Lois, and John, because the book is taking place in three different time periods. In issue two, Superman fights a giant robot, is avoiding the Justice League. Rogel Czar did not die on Krypton and is now headed for Earth. Lois and John are missing for reasons we don't know, and Clark won't tell. The white light gets even brighter in this issue. In issue three, Rogel Czar arrives on Earth, destroys the Fortress of Solitude, and kills all of the Kandorians. Superman and Supergirl investigate while Batman helps investigate the fires. Superman searches for Metropolis until he's confronted by Rogar, and the light is revealed to be Jor-El. In issue 4, Rogar Zalar stomps Supergirl and Superman while wrecking the city. He leaves before he finishes the job and says he's cleansing the Kryptonian race. Green Lantern shows up in time to catch Superman, and Superman finds Rogar Zal at the Fortress of Solitude's ruins and uses his solar flare attack. Jor-El is confirmed to have arrived. In issue 5, Superman and Rogar fight it out on the moon, and Superman loses. The firefighter is looking for a pattern. They put out another fire with the help of the Justice League. They talk to Superman, who is recovering from the fight, and then they discuss Zala's motives. Superman flies to the Earth's core, where Zala is preparing to destroy the planet. Jor-El wants to take John with him. Lewis and Clark disagree and John wants to go. In issue 6, Superman fights Rogar Zal, and with Supergirl's help, holds him off long enough to send him to the Phantom Zone. John and Lois have officially left with Jor-El, and Superman holds a vigil for the Kandorians. That's all six issues. Now, let's get into the good. The art in this book, with the exception of Man of Steel number 5, is absolutely wonderful. Alex Sinclair, is bringing his A-game, and Superman looks incredible in nearly every panel. He was practically born to draw the Man of Steel, and he is killing it in this mini. He may flipping through every page in adventure, and the colorist isn't taking any days off either, leading and lending a great bit of detail to the layout of every panel, leading to a much-deserved, much-needed look to this book that puts on the same level of the Superman titles that preceded the guest appearances from the Just League members are a little fun at the beginning of the series, as it's nice to see Hal Jordan on Earth considering how he's almost never there thanks to the events of Green Lantern Corps. The story, while rather slow, does know how to have some structure. Each part of the story ends on a cliffhanger and manages to let you know that something big is going to happen in the next issue. And finally, the very first issue, Superman has a very Superman-like feel to him. He's very kind. He's very charming, and you can see the farm boy attitude throughout several points in the story. Where saving people comes first, 
It's good to see Superman be Superman. Now it's time for the bad. The biggest problem with this issue is the Jor-El subplot. Superman and Lois are clearly against John going with Jor-El, yet John is insistent on going with his grandfather. Now John was convinced by Jor-El before, but why would he trust him now over his father? He would back his father and mother in this situation, I think, for being true to his character. Superman knew that Jor-El was affected by his staff, but Lois and John don't know that, and they don't even bring it up in this book. Jor-El was talking and acting like Mr. Oz, not like Jor-El, as he did toward the end of the Mr. Oz storyline. If he was acting more sane, it'd be understandable. But as it is, Lois and Superman shouldn't have budged on this issue. What's more, Superman comes off as a, well, a cuck in this scene. He doesn't really get a say. John makes his choice and then Lois backs him, without any real suitable reason. He lets his father just walk off with his wife and son. The plot comes off as mean-spirited. Superman loses his wife and child and it takes an entire four issues for them to actually leave. And in that time, no adequate reason is really given. We're not told why Jor-El is better suited to train John. Sure, Jor-El is more advanced, but that is mostly due to his staff. Clark is still a much better match for his son. The Fortress of Solitude and Kandor are destroyed. Why was it necessary to kill the Kandorians and then have Kara leave Earth? Why did he destroy Krypton, and why does it matter? He committed genocide of entire people, and all that happens is they get a vigil. It's not even mentioning how awkwardly Superman comes off after issue 1. He gets progressively less and less useful and ends up needing help from everyone from Green Lantern to Supergirl. And with his family life, he doesn't really get any say in the decisions as his father makes a choice and his wife and son just go along with it. Not great for a book called Man of Steel. The book is obviously still being paced for a trade, and the art on issue 5, while not directly bad, does not look good compared to the art of the rest of the issue. Not to mention the wonky dialogue that sometimes Borden's on Whedon speak. The mishandling of characterization and outright denial of prior events comes off really badly for a book meant to be a jumping on point from the highly acclaimed run in both Superman and Action Comics before this. The fight scenes don't help. As well drawn as they are, they don't sell you on Rogozov's power or his ferocity. It's described, but Superman's costume is intact throughout the entire miniseries. They make a point to point out that he's close to Brainiac in a way that he's adjusting, yet he still outpaces Superman and stomps him with Kara's help, regardless. They try to pass this off as a skill as a warrior, but rather than it being interesting and being a back and forth between two characters, it comes off with just the title character consistently losing until the book finally ends with a battlefield removal tactic. Not to mention how the book completely undermines and demeans the Superman family aspect of the book that so many people have enjoyed. A huge reason why Superman has been so successful is because they brought back post-crisis Lois and Superman and let them have a son like they did in the previous continuity. People have been enjoying that. People like that. So for this miniseries to go out of its way to strip Superman of basically everything he's been given in Rebirth that made him different from his New 52 counterpart, it's just a major loss. And that's not even getting into the continuity problems, which we have to now because that's a section. This book completely gets wrong John's feelings about why he was denied entry into the Titans. They make it clear that they don't know their own future, and as much as they cannot come to terms with this themselves, they just can't bring another person into the fold. Yet here he breaks down and says that something is wrong with him, even though that's something that was fixed at the end of the Super Sun storyline, and he's still on good terms with Damien, who's his friend and who he cares about being with more than the Titans. Mr. Oz is back despite jor having his personality seemingly returned to him at the end of the Mr. Oz story arc. And despite this, Clark trusts him completely. It was incredibly jarring and made no sense. Then there's Green Lantern being in this book when he's not even on this side of the universe, and they barely even acknowledge it. In fact, they don't. Simon or Jessica would have had far more weight in this regard considering they're the Green Lanterns of this sector. But I guess Bendis isn't woke enough for either of those characters. There's the obvious retcon of Superman's origin, and that's what Bendis is best known for, not caring about continuity, and he probably wants to be known as the guy who changed Superman's origin. But this miniseries doesn't justify the change, nor does it add any depth to it. The complete disregard for post-crisis history of Superman and the Kandorians was a huge mistake on Bendis' part. I won't even get started on the Phantom Zone argument. 
For right now, note that this mini series starts out strong, but with each passing issue, the writing declines, the dialogue becomes more dull, and the interest of the reader steadily wanes. And then there's the fight. Superman has a lot of trouble with things that shouldn't be a problem. He's worried about the Earth's core, and when he's no sold planet level attack previous series. If it's meant to hype me up for Bendis' run, I'm not interested in the least. If I had to assign numbers to it, which I do, Man of Steel number 1 gets a 7.5, Man of Steel number 2 gets a 7, Man of Steel number 3 gets a 6, Man of Steel number 4 gets a 6, Man of Steel number 5 gets a 5, and Man of Steel number 6 gets a 4.5. In total that adds up to 36. Man of Steel as a whole gets a 6 out of 10. If you want to continue to read Superman books, I suggest picking this up so you know what you're getting into. However, if you're not a collector and you don't like the messing with Superman's mythos like this, don't give this issue the time of day. I would not recommend this beyond those who have to have every issue of Superman in their long box. That being said, thank everyone who's here right now for watching this video. I was very happy to get back into doing reviews. I have a lot more videos coming and I hope you guys are ready to enjoy them. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. If you're interested in keeping me up with the discussion, go ahead and hit me in the comments section. Interested in updates on what's next for the channel? Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and other social medias linked in the description box down below. I put all the updates there. And if you're interested in my own thoughts, my Twitter is linked. If you want to discuss any topic in the video, go to our Discord. Linked below will be the SJW Discord server and the Comic Book Narrative Discord servers. That being said, my time is finally done. This has been TAF108 of the Supreme Duo channel, reminding you to stay supreme and to demand more from your comics.